This is the single most important video that I have made for mastering Warhammer 40,000. If you don't suck at this, you will automatically be one of the best players around. So watch this video to the absolute end and learn how to not suck at list building. Super important uh, topic, guys. Okay, let's get right into it. You need a better plan to build your list. And trust me, I'm about to give you a way better plan. Here's the way most people build their list. What they do is they play what they like or they play the most killy models, or they play the cheapest models that they can spam. They'll play hordes to try to oversaturate there. Or, and this is absolutely the worst thing that they like to do, is people like to play what the pros play. I hear this all the time. People are like, well, Jack Harpster said do this. Guys, Jack Harpster is the best player in, this, in the world. He can probably win a tournament, a super major, with a paperclip and a Quiznos sub. But just because he runs a list doesn't mean that you need to be running the list because he's going to have a very different concept of how to play that list than you might. So when you are building your list, maybe you can take inspiration from the pros, but you need to still build it for the way that you would like to play it. All right, so let's get into some freaking rules here. Things have absolutely changed in 10th edition from what they were in 9th edition. Now we don't have to worry about our force organizations, and you can take whatever the heck you like in your army. The only restriction is going to be the rule of three or rule of six if you happen to be battle line. Allies rules are detailed in the individual codexes. So, for example, if you're an Imperial Army, you can include one Titanic Knight or three Armager Class Knights. That doesn't mean you will, but you very well may. All right, first thing that we have to do when we are building our list is we're going to have to define the purpose of our list. A lot of armies have extremely well-defined playstyles that basically every single player of that army are going to do. So, for example, Necrons. Their playstyle is they don't freaking die. They're the best army in the game at not dying, and they don't. It is very odd to for a Necron player to get tabled. I seriously doubt we will see Necrons getting tabled in this edition of the game. That doesn't mean they're going to win every game. I just don't think they're going to get tabled because they're freaking immortal. Your list doesn't need to be made to do absolutely everything. That is the path to madness. So when I'm bringing a list onto the table, I don't have to be able to move block constantly, and I don't have to be able to... Um, redeploy all the time and I don't have to be able to murder all the vehicles and murder all the infantry you don't have to be able to do that you have to be able to do what your list is designed to do and force your opponents to play around your game plan that is how you win then after we are going to identify our primary goal be that survivability overwhelming killiness non-engagement then we're going to decide what you need in order to support so to support your primary goal so let us go ahead and identify what those primary goals in list building is Trust me, guys, we're getting to the solid concrete rules and exactly how you're going to do this. First off, your primary goal is going to be kill everything. When you kill everything, that's what it means. Like, I don't care about scoring points. I'm going to table my opponent and then get the points after they're dead. That is a real strategy. Votan used to do that really well in 9th edition. Currently, knights do this amazingly well in 10th. Uh, Eldar tend to do, this, do the same as well. Then, your second primary goal that you may have, and this doesn't mean that it's less important than the first one, it's just... There's three main primary goals, and then you have to choose which one your army falls for, right? This could be Never Die. So for Never Die, Necrons would be the perfect example of an army whose primary goal is to never die. Custodes are also very good at never dying. Uh, so it's just, is your army tough enough to be able to take everything? Hey, my entire army, my enemies are going to throw everything they have at me, but I'm not going to die, which is going to mean, which means I'm going to hold the primaries, and I'm going to win the game. Then three, you can have an army that they just play pure mission. Now, in last edition, this was the Eldar. They were the kings of this. Very different in 10th edition. <laughs> so, the pure mission. These are the people who don't really need to be engaging with you at all. Um, I think GNC, GSC is probably really good at this, although GSC is also very killy. Uh, you've got certain armies that can... Grey Knights are probably the most pure example of this. They don't need to kill you. They don't really need to survive. But they're always going to be teleporting everywhere. And they're always going to be scoring all the secondaries that they get. They can always be where they need to be. They can always score. So those are like the three, you know, main primary goals that you can have. And I don't think you don't, you don't have to be able to serve all of those goals, but every army has to keep those in mind. So what you can do is you can just figure out how does your army rank compared to all the other armies on these. And you can get really specific. I'm going to use Custodes for this example because that's what I'm bringing to the World Championships. So I'm going to use them as uh, my teaching tool because it's also a smaller army. It's easier for people to grasp. And I'm a mad lad. So what I did is I just went through like the actual number of armies not just like the categories so for kill everything i'm mid to high so custodians are pretty good at killing things they're not as good as eldar they're not as good as knights they're not as good as space marines but they're still pretty dang good at killing things so i was like perhaps they're like fifth ish best so i'm in the middle to high end of the pack 
maybe GSC are a little bit better. So actually, no, let me let me drop that just one. I'm going to put them down like maybe sixth best, but they're very good at killing, even though they're not the best in the game. Never die. They're extremely good at never dying. I think they're probably, in all reality, the second, you could argue the third best army at never dying. The first being would be Custodes, or I'm sorry, Necrons. So Custodes are very good at never dying. And then you have the pure mission play, and they're... They're pretty decent at it. They're good at holding missions just because they're good at holding objectives and things. But they're typically going to be recycling the Investigate Sites card. They're going to be sometimes throwing away the Cleanse card. They're not going to score every second of the day that comes their way. But they're probably going to be scoring a good 30 because they're good at it. And this is the, that's how I filled out this. All right. So now after you get your primary goals, you got to figure out what do you need to support your main goal. First off, if you are a kill every army, you must be able to survive turns one and turn two. This means that you have to have protection from indirect, whether that's because you have just a natural two-up armor save and you will get cover from the indirect, or whether it means that you're going to be in transports. You have to be able to survive the crazy indirect output that's going to be coming into your armies in this game. And this can be extremely challenging to balance. Knights, for example, they get to deploy very aggressively instead of defensively, because if you're playing against knights, you have to hide from the knights, because if the knights happen to go first, they'll table you turn one. If they go second... Chances are very low you have enough anti-vehicle to get them turn one. So their actual way of supporting their kill everything goal is basically just kind of deploying and being like, come at me, bro. Now, two, if you are a never die army, you are going to have your tough units. You're going to have transports to help you increase your toughness. But you really are going to need the ability to move to get onto your primary objectives. You're going to need your redeploys. You're going to need infiltrates and scout moves because... If you're a never die army, but you're not necessarily the best at killing, I like to take Necrons as, the, as this example. Once you get on the objectives, they're probably yours for the whole game, but you still have to get on the objective and chances are high. You have to get there before your opponent. So you're going to need some mobility to go along hand in hand to support your never die mission. Then three is going to be pure mission. Pure missions. Uh, these are the guys. They, they must have their screens. They must have their redeploys, their teleports, high objective control. Grey Knights are probably the best example of a pure mission army right now okay now let's start actually building an army list what are we going to do now what i want you to do is i want you to take your army that you're playing and you're going to make a rough draft of what you like so this is this in this particular list that i'm building right here is i want my list to be able to tank so it doesn't die and i want it to be able to score objectives so i want to be able to score objectives and i want to be able to tank things i don't necessarily need to kill my opponent although every army is going to be able to kill something so uh, my army is primary goal. I'm going to dominate primary and keeping in mind that my chosen army does actually have good killing potential and epic defensive potential. So this is my initial rough draft of custodes, 2000 points. It's actually 1990. So I got Trajan Valoris. He's my warlord. I got a terminator and shield captain. I've got a shield captain on foot. I got a blade champion, a bike captain. And then for my battle line, I have two five man units of custodian guards with spears. And then I have one five man of terminators, one six man of wardens and a three man of virtus praetors, which are the custodian bikes. You don't have to worry about what all those do because I'm going to explain it right now in when we go into the next slide. Check this out. Here enters the matrix. Now, this is how you're going to determine whether or not your army actually does what you want it to do. Okay, so I just read off the list of my army, but now I have to figure out, okay, I have all these units, but do they actually do what my army needs them to do? So what I've done is I've created unit roles and character roles specifically, and these are the roles in your army that your units fill. So when you build your rough draft, you are going to apply all these roles to see what your army is actually good at doing. And that is how you're going to win your freaking game and make sure that you have a very good list to play with. So character roles, we have the fortifier. This is just something that makes units better at their role in general. Then you have the killer. They kill things or they buff their unit to make the unit significantly better at killing things. And the word significantly is really important there. Like if you give you if, if your character just gives your unit like an extra two damage output, that's not a killer. That's just that's, that's just an, an extra attack, right? Then you have army buffers. So these are guys who have like the auras. So you got to think of like Abaddon. Abaddon is an arm is an army buffer because he's going to give that that huge aura of uh, invulns or rerolling hit rolls. So the models that actually have a massive impact upon multiple units, Gulliman, for example, those are fairly rare models. Then you have the defender. This is something that makes your unit significantly more tanky or more um, defensive. And then you have uh, sub characters, and their entire job is to be a CPU generator. They're going to generate you extra command points so that you can use them over the course of your game. And lastly, you're going to have utility. This can be fairly ill-defined. Certain models will have utility because you'll find that certain models give you the opportunity to do something that's just not really defined elsewhere. Um, and I'm actually going to go through an example in just a moment so you can see what that looks like. 
Then for our units, we have damage dealers. And every single army, I, I feel like, really needs two damage dealers. You need something that can kill your opponent. If you don't have those, you're, you're going to struggle. You're going to need objective holders, things that can get on an objective and just make sure that objective belongs to you. You'll need secondary scoring. And uh, basically every unit in the, in the game can score secondaries now. So that was more of a holdover from my ninth edition rules. But you still need to think about secondary scores. You need people who have the redeploys or who have the very fast movement so that you can get into the corners to score your investigate signals, for example. Uh, subcategories of damage dealers, you need anti-tank and you need anti-infantry. You have to be able to deal with someone who's pure infantry. You have to be able to deal with someone who's pure vehicle. Just It's going to come up, so you're going to have to be able to deal with it. Disruption. This is things like movement blocking, movement denying. And I, I like at least two units in your army to have the ability to disrupt movement. This is actually fairly easy now with the stratagem for rapid ingress because your unit that's rapid ingressing, your opponent's going to have to plan around the fact that you will rapid ingress on them. So that will mess with their movement. So that's a fairly easy role to fill in your army. Then you have support staff. Um, these are units like uh, like that can resurrect you or just... just general things that can do uh, pretty cool little buffs for your army that not every army has access to. You're going to want distractions. These are the big distraction carnifexes. Um, so the unit that your opponent is like, oh crap, I have to deal with that. So with the Necrons, that would be the huge warrior blob, or that would be the Lich Guard. For the Custodes, that could be like a massive Guardian squad. For uh, Eldar, it's the Wraith Knight right now. And this will change as the meta develops, but you need a distraction unit. Um, I, I, I like to have a distraction unit in every army. I guess not every army needs it, but it's important. Alpha Strike. Not every army needs an Alpha Strike. If you are a melee army, you absolutely need an Alpha Strike because you're going to have to have a way to force your opponent to deploy a little more defensively against you. You'll need a Plan B. Plan B is the guys or the gals who come out there and save your game when things are going wrong. Um, this can be the Hail Mary unit that is just there to clean up crap when everything else isn't working. Then you need rapid reactions. This can be a redeploy. It can be someone who's just super, super fast. Different things like that. Transports, that depends on the army. And lone operative. Lone operative is awesome. So I'm going to take that exact same custodies list I just built, and I'm going to put it into the matrix. And I'm going to see if it does it do what I want it to do. Cool. This is the exact same custodies list. All right, Trajan Vloris, what does he do? Well, he's a fortifier, he's a killer, and he's a defender. Why? Because he just, generally speaking, makes his entire unit much better at what it already does. Because when he's leading the unit... They are unmodifiable. You can't modify their movement. You can't modify their toughness. You can't modify their hit or wound rolls. So he just makes them better at everything. He himself is quite killy with that flat three damage, which is lacking in the Custodes army. And as a defender, he actually makes his arm, his unit much more survivable because, because since you have him, when someone charges his unit, he's just going to make his unit fight first. So he does make them significantly more tanky as well. Terminator Shield Captain. He is going to be my CP support. Because once per, once per battle round, he will allow me to use the CP even if it's already been spent. That's really good. My shield captain also does the same thing. And I'm going to give him the aspect of killer because he lets me use two katas at once. So he is uh, he's, he's pretty usable. Then we have the blade champion. He gives alpha strike potential. So I'm going to use that as a utility keyword. So I gave him the utility keyword because he can allow one of my units to advance and charge. Bike captain. He gives a normal move at the end of the fight phase once per game. Now, before... Before you, you click off, I'm not going to keep the battle the, the bike captain in this list, and I'm going to explain why in just a moment. Because even though he has a great utility and he's a CP generator, he is not making the cut. Then for my battle line, we have two five-man custodian guards. They are good at holding objectives. They can kill things that get into melee, but they're not like dedicated damage dealers. So I gave them the objective holder keyword because that is their role. Everything else they do is ancillary. Other, we've got the Terminators, of uh, the five-man Terminators. Now, these guys are very usable units. They give me a movement disruption uh, because you have to be reactive to the fact that they're going to deep strike or rapid ingress on you. They have rapid reactions because once per game, they can redeploy. And then they also deal a lot of damage, and they are a great plan B unit thanks to that redeploy. So they are a super useful unit. Then I have the Wardens. They're objective holders, and they're a big distraction because you just have to deal with them, and it's going to be very challenging to chew through them. And then finally, we've got Virtus Praetors times three. And they don't get a roll. Um, and that was a big problem. That's why I'm actually having to drop the Virtus Praetors. Because even though I like them and they're like my favorite models for the Custodes, and I, last edition they were the whole flavor of the Custodes, they are going to have to be removed. So what I'm looking at is what am I missing? I'm missing a damage dealer because I don't have a real damage dealer. I don't have a real distraction card effects. Uh, you could say the Wardens are a little bit distraction, but in all reality, you don't actually have to deal with them. You can play around them. I don't have any support mechanisms in my army. Uh, I have zero transports, and I don't have any access to loan operative. These are really big problems. So I'm going to have to reformulate my list. And through the magic of the internet, I did it. 
So let's just guess out. What I did is I removed the bikes and I removed the bike captain because that was a massive amount of points uh, that could easily have been filled by something else. And then I included some allies into my detachment to, to shore up some of the holes that I was missing. So Trajan Floris is exactly the same. He's a fortifier, he's a killer, he's a defender. I kept the shield captain and terminator armor for the CP support, but I actually dropped the shield captain on foot. Now, that is flavor. Some people want to keep the shield captain on foot. Some people want to keep the shield captain armor. I'm keeping the terminator armor because I want to buff up my terminators a little bit more with that constant being able to interrupt and fight first or being able to minus one damage them. So that's why I kept him. But you don't need both because they're redundant. So since they were both redundant uh, and you can only use the CP, the free CP stratagem once per battle round and you can't, you can't use it on both of them, only one of them can do it, I decided to drop them. And that saved me 120 points. Now we have a blade champion and he gives alpha strike potential. And I also, since I saved a little bit of points from the way that my army list construction went, I gave him the Ceaseless Hunter upgrade. Now this actually adds movement disruption to his portfolio because now suddenly he gets, he gets to fall back, shoot and charge with his unit. And once per game, whenever someone moves within nine inches of him, his unit can move a free not six inches, which is really, really strong. And people are going to have to play around that, which is a big problem. So then I look at the battle line. This is how I've changed things. I have a nine guardian unit now with one banner. Now, since we go to a nine man, suddenly this unit becomes a damage dealer because that unit actually has the potential to chew through just about anything in the game. And no one can disrespect them because they are terrifying. They are a great objective holder and they absolutely qualify as a distraction because they have to be dealt with. Now, when I attach the blade champion to it, which I will, they're also gaining the alpha strike potential. And that is such an amazing, amazing thing. Then we look at a five man guardian squad. These guys maintain their one main role of an, of an objective holder. I actually added a second Terminator squad unit. So I have the one five man. I kept that. And now I have a second third man. The second third man, they're not necessarily damage dealers just because they don't have the, the, the weight of dice, but they can, they can, they'll mess up an MSU squad or they'll mess up, they'll mess up a, a decent amount of stuff, but they're not going to go out and just crush what a sheet, what a big five man will do, but they're still movement disruptors, the rapid reactions to their plan B. So I have a lot more utility in my army now already. I kept the wardens because it's great to have an objective holder. And I kept the keyword distraction because you don't have to deal with them, but suddenly in conjunction with the fact that I have the big nine man that you also have to deal with, now you're running into real distraction problems. Then what I did is I added two allies to my studies list to make this list very, very um, dynamic. Kyria Draxis, she's 75 points, and she gives an 18-inch lone operator bubble. Uh, in her command phase, on a two-up, suddenly her unit is untargetable if you're outside of 18 inches. So what I do now is, since I dropped my shield captain on foot, I actually replaced him with Kyria Draxis to go with the five-man guardian squad. So suddenly I have a five-man guardian squad that I can put pretty much anywhere on the on the tabletop, and as long as I make sure my measurements are right, you can't shoot them, which means they are unbelievably survivable, which means you have to get melee, which suddenly makes that unit that was only an objective holder also a damage dealer, because you're going to have to get into melee with them or get close enough to them to allow them to get in melee with you to be able to actually shoot them. Kyria Draxis gets so much support here. Then I also lastly include the Eversor Assassin. He is a lone operator and he is a rapid reactions because he's very fast with that base move of a nine and you can give him an advance in charge. He gives my US army something that it didn't have, which is a solo unit that can't be shot really. I mean, it technically it can, but it's very hard to shoot him and he's very fast and he smashes your smaller squads and he's pretty cheap, which is something my army didn't have. So that's how I rebuilt the list. Now, what am I missing out of my keywords? I'm missing a transport, but my army doesn't need a transport. If you remember the rules, a transport is optional. You definitely don't absolutely have to have it. So if we put right here, transport depends on army. Now, let me just highlight that for you. Depends on army. So you don't necessarily have to have it. So then lastly, what I want to do is I'm just going to go through some pitfalls. And this is something that people always mess up on list building. But if you follow the rules as I gave you, you probably won't make these pitfalls. Just because you can ally in something doesn't mean you should. And the list that I am proposing for my custodes, which I'm really happy with right now, by the way, it's crushing people. Uh, I did decide to ally in Kyria Draxis and the Eversor Assassin. Uh, so, and, but I didn't include knights. Why didn't I include knights? Knights are good, right? I, I think I've harped on how good knights are. Well, why don't I put Armagers or Helverins or even a, a big towering knight in there? They could be a good idea, but they might not be. For my army, my army's goal is to get on objectives and then to close really quickly with the big squad so that I can slap, slap you in melee. My five-man custodian's job is to hold my backfield objective or hold a center objective and never be shot. If I included a big knight or like maybe some small knights, what's going to happen is they're going to have some reasonable shooting firepower, but 
they're still going to be completely outclassed by any other really long-range army. Which means they're probably just going to die to any real long-range army. And then that's going to take away a huge chunk of points that my Custodes need to be effective at their short to medium range. So I don't think that the inclusion of Knights with my Custodes army is a good idea. Although some people may have a very different Custodes list where it's a good idea. So I love the Assassins for Custodes for the reasons I just gave you. The Eversor, I think, is my favorite. Um, the Calidus is actually a really good option as well for the Vect. But I chose not to do it in my list. You do not have to spam the best unit in your Codex. Personally, currently, I think the... Terminators are the best units for the Custodes. They fill so many keywords, they do so many roles, they don't need character support because they're always going to be getting wound rerolls against vehicles, monsters, and characters. But I don't need three units of them. I need one big brick, and I like having a smaller brick just for some utility. So you don't have to spam the best units in your codex if getting more of them doesn't necessarily make your army better. I have what I need, and it serves really, really well. CP usage. How much CP do you actually need? Well, for my army, I need to always have two CP in the bank. And that's why I have included my Terminator Shield Captain, who's going to be giving me a free two CP stratagem once per battle round. And this is also really important for your planning for how many secondaries are you actually going to score. Do you need to always be discarding one of your secondaries if you're playing tactical missions, which you probably are. Uh, for me, I don't have to do that. I do have to probably discard one secondary. Um, and it's generally that's going to be in the first round just to get me to the points that I actually need. Then you have over-redundancy. This is a huge problem. Not everything in your army needs to be able to kill everything in your opponent's army. <laughs> People, um, this was more of an issue in 9th edition when we had upgrades, but it's coming up in 10th edition when people are going to be releasing codexes. I can almost guarantee you we're going to see war gear upgrade cost. And once that becomes a real big problem, you don't have to fully upgrade every unit. Um, for right now, you don't have to worry about it because we're an index hammer and basically all war gear is free. But once the codexes get released, get ready to pay points for your uh, for your war gear. But you don't always have to pay for the upgrades. And then killing power. Some units can actually be too killy. I actually do this as an example for my orc friends. Yes, I love the orcs even though I'm doing uh, a custodian as an example. Let me do an orc example real quick. If I have a five-man unit of knobs with a war boss, then that five-man unit of knobs with a war boss will kill six terminators on average when they charge the terminators. So they're going to kill the five-man unit of Terminators. They're going to crush an Armager. They're going to crush basically anything that they charge that isn't like a Satan, right? So what do I gain by making that a 10-man knob unit? Basically nothing. Because the five-man is going to charge. They're going to kill what they charge. And then on my opponent's turn, the clapback, they're going to kill my knob squad. It's just it's going to happen because that, that unit's not going to survive a clapback. And a 10 man is not going to survive what they put into it either. So basically, no matter what happens, when you run that unit of knobs up to go kill your opponent, they're going to be successful, but then your opponent's going to kill them in their next shooting phase. So if I'm going to be successful, regardless of whether it's a 5 man or a 10 man, I might as well just use the 5 man because then when I lose the 5 man, I only lose 115 points and not 230 points, right? So that's my reasoning. You don't always have to have every single killing option possible. You just need just enough killing to be able to support the goal. All right, everyone, these are my super defined terms of engagement for building our list for Warhammer 40,000 in 10th edition. This is a um, really, really important video for all of you guys. I hope you love it. Please, please share this video because more people need to know how to build lists. I have lo a lot of the lists that I look at for people are just they're just too ill-defined. Maybe people will put, take a lot of really good units and throw it together and expect it to do well, but what they see is that it just does not synergize. I talked, We talked about a lot about synergy on our Necrons tier list video where my buddy Shetel went over the plan for Necrons. If you haven't watched that in your Necrons player, you really should check it out. It's going to be super beneficial for you. But if your unit doesn't synergize with the rest of the army, it doesn't matter if it's necessarily good, unless your plan is to have one unit that whose job is just to go out there, kill something, and die, and then the rest of your army does something else. But that's got to be part of your plan. Don't go take a pros list and just expect the, the list to perform. These lists only perform because of the pros who are piloting them. Uh, that's basically all I have to say for today. Uh you might have to watch this video a few times. That's totally okay. I had to go through my things a few times when I was making it. So no stress there, everybody. Follow these rules. Share with your friends. Love you till next time. Happy Crump and my favorite Wargamers. Bye.